Welcome to WooCommerce Live, Season 2, Episode 1. I'm Jonathan Wold, and I lead community initiatives here at WooCommerce. With me is my co-host, Noel Steegs, a merchant-turned-developer who also volunteers here in the community. Hi, Noel. Good to see you. Hey, good to see you too, Jonathan. We've got a fantastic guest here with us today as well, who will join us a bit later. So at WooCommerce, we're on a mission to democratize commerce, which for us means making it accessible to everyone. We want to inspire you with what's possible. We want to empower you to move from inspiration to action and then keep making it easier to get started. And the way we, we do that a few ways, we do that through community, which includes our Facebook group and local meetups around the world. We do that through software with WooCommerce, which runs on WordPress, which is the, uh, the best tool for creating content on the web. And we do that through education and training, including things like WooCommerce Live. On today's episode, we're going to be starting a eight-part series focused on helping you go from idea to first customer, and more on that in a little bit. We're going to start off, though, today with the Community Spotlight, where we look at wins from across the WooCommerce community and share some of our favorite resources. Then we'll jump into today's topic and do some live Q&A afterwards. So, Noelle, what uh, wins do we have to celebrate in the community today? Yeah, um, we got some awesome ones that I want to highlight. Um, first of all, I want to put a spotlight on a Facebook community member of ours. Um, his name is Prabha. He's a digital analyst and he lives in Sri Lanka and he joined only a month ago, but he's been helping quite a few of our community members uh, solving the issues. And I saw specifically like things about Google Analytics or integration with Facebook, those specific questions, I saw him jumping on quite a bit. So um, yeah, thanks Brava for helping others out. That's what the community is all about. So awesome to see. Um, also, since the previous season of WooCommerce Live, I'm um, really happy to share that the community has grown by more than 2,000 members, which wow. is, you know, which is just awesome to see it grow like that. So a big welcome to our new members. Um, for those who don't know, I put a, I put a post mm. out on Mondays to see what's been happening in the community. So I do this in, in the Facebook group and I ask for people to share, you know, share your, share your store. Have you launched? Have you had a record sale? You know, please share it with us because we love to hear these kind of things. And we love to see, you know, all the different people that are part of the community and all the different things that they use WooCommerce for, you know, it's so diverse. So that's really, that's really cool. Oh, um, yeah. it's awesome to see people engaging in that. That's, that's one of the favorite things, right? To see new people coming in, helping each other, asking questions, answering questions and sharing what they're working on. So that's, that's great. Uh, also we have, uh, the meetups that I think it's worth mentioning. We have small meetups or small groups of folks around the world that get together to help store owners at the moment. They're all virtual which is a great opportunity to connect with, be a guest at a local meetup in an area that uh, you know, doesn't, wouldn't otherwise have one. I wanted to just spotlight one particular meetup, which is the uh, London meetup. They meet every week on Wednesdays um, and they're going right now through a series where they're helping folks get to their first customer by Christmas, I think is the target. So that's, that's uh, pretty awesome. All right, and uh, and and if you're interested in meetups, you can go to WooCommerce.com forward slash meetups and find out more about uh, uh, the meetups that are available in your area. I'd love to be, see you be a part of that. Uh, so we have some favorite resources that we've found that you put together. So let's take a look at that. What uh, what have you found, Noel? Um, so the first, the first one is one of my favorite resources, also personal. Um, it's from Seth Godin. And those who don't know, you know, Seth is a serial entrepreneur. He's a fantastic marketer yeah. and his, and his, his blog is filled with often very short and I, and digestible, sometimes longer posts, but these insights that are just amazing. And I, you know, I go back regularly myself. Um, and in this post, he talks about being in search of the minimal, minimum viable audience. Um, so he explains that, you know, it isn't a lot of people when they start out, they want to target everybody. They want to market, sell their products to everybody. Yeah. Um, but in this post, he explains why 
that often doesn't work um, and you know what you should be doing instead. Um, so really niching down and focus on specific audience, which is of course what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, very, very timely. Next up, uh, you found the restaurant for WooCommerce plugin, which is, so there's been a lot with COVID and all this stuff and restaurants have been particularly affected and it's been great to see more resources available to help restaurants make that transition to online. There's a lot of good tutorials. It was great to see this extension come out fairly recently, which brings a bunch of extra functionality and puts some of those pieces in one step, in one place. So really happy to see that and hoping to see more, more of that. Next up, you uh, picked this one. Yeah, I couldn't not pick it. So yeah. for those who don't know, I'm I'm Dutch and stroopwafel is like a, a typical Dutch. Um, it's like a, yeah, it's like a waffle with caramel in between. You put it's it on delicious. a cup and it gets on a cup of hot coffee or tea and it gets all soft. It's just, it's the best. I miss them, honestly. But um, any case, I thought it was also um a wonderful showcase of what WooCommerce can do. Um, and, you know, it has, it's multi, it's multilingual. They have an integration where you can customize your own tin, you know, you can drag and drop things around and it's just really cool. I feel every element on this site is on brand. Um, I love the allergy information as well, like, mm. and how um, when you scroll up, um close to the close to the uh, close to the add to cart button you know they'll they'll outline they'll say like you pay safely and things like that so that's yeah that's, that's really that great mm. that's fantastic next up <clears throat> our friends at hubspot uh put together this fantastic guide to email marketing it's a great uh piece of education on the topic and a lot of really good resources. They've got a lot of stuff. They education is a big part of what they do. And I was really happy to, to see this. If you're interested in learning more about email marketing, this is a great resource to jump into. And speaking of email, last but not least. Yeah, it's the email customizer plus. Um, so I actually recently had a client who was looking to customize both the content and the styling of the email. Um, and so I had to look around and I knew of some plugins that did styling, but not a lot that, no plugins that were feature packed like this because you can really drag and drop so many different elements and style them all in there. Um, and my client was really happy with it. He managed to really up the look of his uh, of his order emails and he did it all himself and he's not techie so yeah i thought that's really great yeah that's that's fantastic that's fantastic uh, emails are a really important part of any kind of e-commerce setup and when you can have some more customization over it that's that's great okay awesome <clears throat> so now we're going to get to our, our topic for the day which is choosing our audience and before we get into that i want to welcome our guest Greg, it's great to have you. Um, let's go ahead and, and unmute. And uh, as you do that, I'm going to introduce Greg. So Greg uh, Kar Karolitz is the global head of WordPress partnerships at HubSpot. HubSpot's focused on helping businesses grow with what they call inbound marketing. So rather than just going out to others, you want to actually do things that provide value that help have people come into you. They do that through education, software, and community. And recently they've been doing a lot more with WordPress and WooCommerce and given the topic and the, just the general marketing focus, I asked Greg if you'd join us. Greg, it's great to have you. Thanks for having me on. Can you guys hear me okay now? Perfect. I was only singing your reviews and raves behind on the new <laughs> button. So, uh, so we'll have to repeat that a little later on in the, in the show. It's great to have you, Greg. So Greg, you've had quite a bit of experience in the world of e-commerce. You have your own e-commerce businesses and you've helped a lot of others kind of get up and running. Um, of all the types of businesses that you could be involved in, like what do you like about e-commerce? It's a, it's a great question. I think if we think about the world today and how connected we all are, um, we all have these in our pockets. Yep. We all have, for the most part, internet access wherever it is we need to be or wherever we go. And uh, we live in an on-demand world. And I think what's kind of cool about e-commerce today is if you as a merchant are looking to reach a set of customers, which we'll probably jump into a little bit later on today, um, with a good website, 
set up with an e-commerce store and the right ways to market and message to your audience, you can connect with anybody anywhere today, which is, I actually think kind of crazy to think about it. Maybe we take it for granted, but e-commerce, and it's still infant, what what businesses are able to do moving from retail to e-commerce or starting solely as e-commerce and letting their business evolve from there. It's truly special. And and the way that you can do it too is very little overhead. It can cost almost nothing Mm -hmm. to start a business today. And if you start with e-commerce and you do it correctly and starting with a good audience, um, you can build a really successful business, big or small, um, from anywhere, which is just, I I think, uh, almost like a superpower today. Yeah. Yeah. It's easy. It's easy to take for granted. Uh, so I'm curious if you weren't involved because you've been in this space for a long time. If you weren't involved in the world of marketing and e-commerce, what else would you do? Is there even another world? <laughs> no, I just, I just kidding. Um, my my passion um, ever since I was in middle school, uh, I, I grew up as a wrestler and doing oh. working. Um, Interesting. And, and so um, one of my passions, which I'm no longer doing today, that I would definitely do if I if the internet didn't exist, uh, <laughs> would be teaching and coaching uh, nice. and, and building things uh, more so in the physical space rather than the digital space. But that's where I'm, uh, I love to use the hands to try to figure out how to build things. And stuff. That's awesome. And, and Noel, so you're, you're a developer and work with clients building online stores and you actually started your career building your own. What, what inspired you to get involved in the world of e-commerce? Um, so, I had a I had a platform on on Facebook. I had a Facebook page where people came to me for uh, advice in a specific niche I was in. And when they asked me for advice, they often asked about products as well and whether I could recommend any. Oh. Um, but what I found is that then my only options were if I wanted to make a bit of money from that, they were affiliate links of products that. I hadn't seen myself, didn't feel right to recommend them. The commission was small. So then I came into this, somebody mentioned the phenomenon of drop drop shipping to me. And that was like, how do you mean I can sell products without buying inventory? So yeah, so that fueled it all. And yeah, I, and I, and I got going, you know, Google, Google all the things and, you know, came across WooCommerce very quickly. And um, I've been with WooCommerce since this is now eight years ago or something. That's awesome. I mean, and it sounds like in your case too, like you found an audience that needed something and that sort of naturally led to, if I mm-hmm. want to help this audience, then e-commerce is a, a logical way to do that. Mm-hmm. So let's jump into the topic. <clears throat> so more people are buying online than ever before, especially right now. And there's more opportunity than ever before for entrepreneurs to start e-commerce businesses. That's what we want to see here at WooCommerce. And that's what we want to help more people do. Now, a lot of people, when they get started, they'll sort of naturally go to, okay, well, I need a website. And I need some products to sell, right? And, and in our experience, a lot of those businesses fail. They build a site and no one shows up. Those that succeed tend to do something different. They understand that people buy things to solve problems, right? People don't just buy randomly. It's, it's in search of a problem. And since people are unique and all have different problems, although there's certainly shared ones, they'll choose an audience that has similar problems and go from there. And that's where we're going to start with this series. Our goal is to help you go from the idea of starting an e-commerce business all the way to getting your first customer. And the first step is choosing an audience. Now, the way that we think about an audience here at WooCommerce is it's simply the people that you want to serve, right? Now, I'm sure some of you guys have maybe seen this. New entrepreneurs will start out with, uh, oh, I want to serve everyone. Like, you know, it's all fair game. I can sort of do whatever, right? There's no limits. And Earth, uh, I was actually surprised by this when I was checking. I, th- I grew up with like $6 billion in my head, and it's like $8 billion now. And we're all different. We care about different things and we have different problems to solve. So the question becomes, okay, you can't realistically serve everyone. How do you narrow it down? The, the most common or a common way that it's done is through external similarities. And that's this idea that people have things in common that you can observe. Well, it's their age, gender, geography, like where they live, uh, income, a little harder to observe, but there's often tells and life stage. 
this is pretty common. And a good example might be a restaurant owner who says, I want to serve all the people who live in my city, right? The problem though, is that even though people might seem similar on the outside, it's, that's just not how it works. People are really different. We find that entrepreneurs who do well in e-commerce choose a different approach. And that's to focus on what we call internal similarities, people who share interests and values, who care about similar things. Um, and it's, it's pretty simple, actually. It just requires you looking past what you can see, which for us humans can be difficult sometimes. With our restaurant example, for instance, a better approach might be to say, I want to serve people in my city who love Indian food. Right. Like, mm. and you might live in a city where no one likes Indian food and that wouldn't be a good idea or, or they just don't know that they like it yet. Uh, or you might be in a place where there's plenty of people who like it. So it, it's that idea of focusing on serving an audience of people who care about similar things, who have shared interests and values. So I'm curious, Greg, in your experience working with entrepreneurs, what are some of the mistakes that you've seen in the narrowing down process? Yeah. I think it actually goes to what what you mentioned here, which is what's perceived with external facades doesn't always align with internal feelings. So, for example, and, and I've made this, day, this mistake countless times, um, I tend to think that people like me have similar problems. Mm. So some entrepreneurs that I've helped advise, but also some of the own businesses that I've started, I'm trying to solve for myself when the reality is um, if I'm like a, 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 a younger male, um, and I'm having these intrinsic issues yep. that I'm trying to fix, I think other people like me might have those same ones. And I think the, the, the thing that is super helpful to kind of peel back a little bit is to know the intrinsic problems and then find the psychographics and demographics that meet those problems. Mm -hmm. so really funny. In one of the products that I created, I tried to build it for myself because I really wanted it. But my best buyers of the products were actually uh, 50 to 60 year old women that had kids. Mm. That is not it. <laughs> and so after a bunch of research and finding what the true audience was for it, uh, a jewelry company that I created. Nice. Um, all my marketing and audience messaging was totally tailored to people that are more like myself. When the reality is I needed to shift it to be more like the people that truly had the intrinsic problems. Those yep. 50 to 60 year old women that had one, two or three kids. And so when I was able to figure that out is when businesses started to actually or individuals start to, to come to my site. And so in that experience, like, what do you think was the mistake that you made? Because you ended up going through that process and figuring out. But what was the starting point? Was it just focusing on on your yourself as an audience or or what or do you even see it as a mistake? Like two things. Yeah. One, in our heads as entrepreneurs we come up with this, uh, this vision of what we think reality is really like. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and we're so fixed on our vision of reality that the second issue is we don't actually go to figure out the market research and what the audiences um, feel, look like, who they may be, to then kind of shift the focus of your business. If I had done that earlier, I probably would have found the right audience way sooner and not have wasted time, resources like money, energy, um, whatever it may be, um, and would have super uh, been super helpful in narrowing that scope of, of who my target audience is rather than fail, 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 only to realize that it was right in front of my face. Yeah. So things that I would have done differently would have definitely have been do some market research. Um, also, try with your store to potentially run Facebook or Google ads to a whole bunch of different audiences. So you can get quick data sets, mm. see which one's converting most, uh, most highly um, from, you know, click to view to purchase, and then start to figure out if that data aligns with your assumptions. And if it does, great. And if it doesn't, take a step back to actually think about who are we serving and what's the problem that we're trying to fix. Now, Noel, in your experience as a developer, uh, so merchants will come to you at different stages in the process, right? So some have already mm -hmm. figured that stuff out, but I'm curious, are there any mistakes or challenges that stand out to you that you've seen merchants have in that narrowing down process? Yeah, I would say so. Um, you know, first, there are a lot of people who will say, I want to serve everyone. I think it's quite a common statement to hear. Um, 
but I've also met an entrepreneur who sold, who sold clothing that was on the expensive side. And she said, well, I'm just going to target these, you know, these teenagers, you know, they'll really like the style, but her website didn't end up getting sales. They got some views, but the sales just kept out. And, you know, looking back, we both think it was a misalignment with, you know, okay, I want to target these teenagers that like this boho style, but they actually were missing, you know, the income to yeah. to make purchases from that website. So I think it's also about, you know, the unique combination of these internal and external factors um, where it can really make a difference. Uh, it's it's interesting too, because in that teenager example, and we'll talk about this more next week. So you can say, I'm going to, I'm going to focus on teenagers, but when you look at what problems that they have and the resources available, like there's a misalignment there. Like to, in most cases, selling a lot of expensive clothes to teenagers, it's a much narrower audience, I should say, of those who have mm -hmm. access. Yes. To it. So let, let's talk about why choosing an audience matters because like a lot of, and it's pretty common. It's pretty common for an entrepreneur to go in and just sort of like your experience, Greg, like kind of jump into something or, or get something up and running. And, and here's the thing, like it can work, but oftentimes when it works, it's not for the reasons you think it works, which is why we advocate for making a conscious decision about who you're going to serve. So let's talk for a moment about why that matters. There's three things that stand out for us. The first is this what we call like message impact. When you're clear on who your audience is, the words that you use, the message that you convey can be a lot more specific. You can speak directly to an audience. You can make, you can uh, mm. speak their language. You can use relevant examples and it just makes your content a lot more effective. The second thing is what we call value focus. It's this idea that when you have a specific audience in mind, you can make sure that the things that you're offering are just clearly aligned with value to them as an audience. And then the last is differentiation. When you're clear on who your audience is, you have the opportunity to make your business stand apart in both what you do and don't do, what you sell and don't sell in, in a way that can help really make it clear like how you're different from others. And uh, especially when, especially when you're competing at a global level, where like online, the more distinct and different you can be, in general, that's a pretty significant advantage. So, so Greg, in your experience, and with the merchants that you've worked with, have you seen any good examples? So, you shared one in your own experience, like or positive or negative, of why choosing an audience matters. Yeah, and let's actually, I think, to one of the the spotlights you'd given earlier was like WooCommerce for restaurants. I have a. Mm. Uh, a family friend of mine that I'm that I'm helping with their uh, new endeavor. Um, basically, their business was upended with COVID, where they were doing food distribution to restaurants um, and small grocery stores all throughout New England. When COVID hit, um, none of those restaurants were open. None of those grocery stores were were you know asking for new products, so they had to totally pivot their business model to basically go direct to consumer and build an online grocery store. What's cool about their product, and I think this is a positive and negative um, light in this example, is they have very high-end produce and products. Mm, mm -hmm. And so what's cool about that is to your, your, your points here on why choosing an audience matters is they said, we want to be the at-home grocery delivery for everybody in New England. Um, the reality is with their high level of quality in their product, it also comes with a higher price tag. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. and so what they realized was when they started to focus on a few different towns and a few different demographics and psychographics, they started to get many new orders, but repeat customers and people uh. talking down the street saying, Hey, we have this awesome grocery delivery service. Here's a, and we, they, they put in a, uh, give 15, get 15 oh, brilliant. Off, yep. um, with WooCommerce. And they started seeing such a viral effect to their high quality produce. What was interesting was when they decided to say, we want to market to everybody and started to open up their advertising and their, their audience to everybody in New England. Um, people would maybe make a first order because they gave them a good incentive to purchase. Yeah. But what they realized was that it was very hard to get those people to buy again or to create this viral effect because it wasn't the right demographic and psychographic for this high quality produce. Yeah. 
um, when they nailed their target demographic and their audience, they started putting the right messaging on their website, like the big hero uh, images and text. They started having easy steps on how to order and deliver. And then they, Mm. they took their customer appreciation to the next level by uh, automating some of the outreach after people have made three orders ah. to say, thank you so much for being a valued customer. Is there anything more that we would, uh, that you would like from us in terms of selection or, you know, service engage with them. They're at a premium level and that made the viral effect go even more. So by focusing on the wrong people, kind of in like their phase two, uh, it actually allowed them to course correct to, go deeper into the demographic and psychographic of their, their audience and really focus their, their verbiage and photos um, and spend time in the right marketing channels that would create that viral effect of a customer referring people, which has been a huge lift in their business. That's awesome. Noel, how about in your experience, any, any examples, positive or negative of why choosing an audience matters of the value of it? Yeah, that actually recently see a very positive example. So um, this uh, uh, this guy, he had a dog, like so many people do, and he and he had this problem, right? Because he figured that if you want to put like a um, like a dog door on a sliding door, it's difficult, it's expensive. There's a lot of cons. Yeah. So, you know, so he developed a prototype for this product that, you know, sees a dog there, you know, opens the sliding door. It's super easy to install. It's a lot less expensive. You know, he was part of the dog community, you know, obviously started sharing and putting up a um, fundraiser on Kickstarter that got wow, funded nice. within eight hours or something. There was really nothing like his product out there. Um, and, you know, and I feel like dog lovers is possibly such an easy community niche to connect with, right? I mean, you can literally market your product in the park. I mean, how fantastic is that? So, yeah, so I thought that was a really great example. I even love the specificness, too, because there's lots of dog owners, but th- then there's a, a subcategory of people who just really love their dogs and will do a lot with it, right? Mm-hmm. Like that willing to spend more there's people who have dogs because like, just the kids want it or whatever else and those are people who really invest in it as well and if you focus on yes. them they're like we're, we want the best for our dog and, we're, and yes. yeah spend a lot and then they listen to the community as well with the products that they're going to develop later on as well so they listen to the problems like oh but i wish it could do this or what about my cat you know so yeah so that's feeding them more more information to develop more products is really that's such, yeah. that's such an important awesome. point. Just like Greg mentioned with the after the third purchase, asking the customers for feedback. When when you focus on a specific audience, you can start this positive feedback loop process where you're like, okay, we, we're we're providing value to you, um, and you're confirming that by buying, and we want to do more of that. We want to do more of that. And when you're focused on an audience that can, that can help you be more and more specific and more value. Whereas if it was a broad spectrum, you're going to get mixed feedback. One audience is going to say, mm-hmm. get cheaper products. The other one's going to say, get more selection. And uh, how do I, you know, how do I navigate that? And you can't. So, so the question becomes, so as we start to wrap this up, how do you choose an audience? And in our experience, there's two approaches that stand out. The first is that you can choose an audience that you already know, which is like a group of people that you're a part of, well connected to, where you have those shared, ex- you know, some shared external, but mostly shared internal things. Like you love dogs, right? And uh, or or you live in an area and you love high quality produce. The, the other approach that you can take is to work with someone who already knows an audience. So as an entrepreneur, for instance, you may have an idea and uh, maybe you don't know that audience super well and you can find someone who does, who you can work with as the subject matter expert. I w- neither approach is necessarily right or wrong. And as entrepreneurs, we tend to you know, b- look all over the place for things. I, I think it's uh, just be important to recognize that they have advantages and they are different approaches, right? If you want to go into something where you really know nothing about it in order to serve that audience effectively it's usually best to be connected with someone in that audience who is a subject matter expert greg i'm curious in your experience um yeah what what stands out to you about those approaches like you have the jewelry example that that you shared earlier 
what experiences have you had in in those different approaches? There, there's pros and cons to both. Mm -hmm. I think it, if uh, I think for for those watching, um, I think it's important to also know who you are in mm. choosing a path. For for example, what I mean by this is, um, in my experience, I see folks that choose an audience they already know be more passionate about it typically. Um, have more education that they can blog about and create content about that comes across as more genuine and authentic. They can also kind of wear the brand on their sleeve of whatever their business is, and it comes across as uh, very knowledgeable and genuine, which I think is a huge uh, pro. With that, it also comes with some biases, meaning um, I think this is this way, so I'm going to go you know, staunchly into this direction with this set of, uh, of a product. Um, I think that's where the audio, the other, the other approach may be more successful. Is sometimes when you come in with having no biases and a super clean, open set, you can actually see the problems a little bit more clearly that allow you to make a more knowledgeable product that yeah. is solving a real pain. Yep. So I think I would encourage people to kind of take a step back and and maybe do a combo of both in some regard, where you know what your biases are. With that, without letting that kind of lead and steer your product direction, because at the end of the day, I do think where where, where I buy and where I see a lot of people um, purchase from is from genuine businesses that create that what I like to call that oh my gosh that's me moment when you mm -hmm. hit that website and mm -hmm. you go they know exactly my pain they know exactly my problem and they lay out what the solution is right in front of you. And I think that's where choosing an audience you already know can be super helpful because you might be a part of that and know what yep. the real pains are and solve for it. But on the flip side, if you care a lot about researching and finding a perfect fit or a really good fit for an audience that you don't know that well, you might find something that would otherwise be um, unaware or uh, maybe not obvious to somebody already in that community. Um, but I, I hope that's helpful, Mike. That's awesome. Figuring out the approach on, on which direction to take. So wrapping this up, at the end of it for us, like what we want folks to do is to choose an audience. And, and my guidance is to, to be specific. Entrepreneurs are sometimes afraid of just missing out. Like, Oh, I don't want to choose because I could miss out on this and that. And I get it. It's that's, that's a thing. But those who do the best are those who are willing to be specific. You can change your mind later. You could expand later. Just be specific, make a decision about who you're going to serve. Um, any, any last thoughts to add? Noel? I wish I could remember the marketer who said this, but it was all about this guy who was going to buy a drill. I hope it was. Um, and it was about the guy's not buying a drill. The guy wants to make a hole in the wall. But why does the guy want to make a hole in the wall? He wants to hang up a shelf. But why does he want to hang up the shelf? Because he wants to make his wife happy. And it like yep. drills down. It isn't exactly quoted. I wish I remembered it better, but it does explain like, it's not what's on the surface. It's what what really drives us in the end. You know, when you take everything away, what's at our core, like making a partner happy. Or yeah, oh, I love it, Greg. Any last thoughts from you? Honestly, I think maybe in building on that, it's like don't stop uh, until you fully understand what that gut wrenching problem is for people that Noel was just mentioning there. It's like I think. Um, uh, some of the big consulting firms mention that you have to ask why five times to get to the root problem of, uh, of, mm -hmm. of what people initially ask. And like, that's probably the best advice anybody could ever give you. It's like, don't just hear what you want to hear. Keep yeah. going until you realize that that is the core problem and then try to solve that if that's an audience that you think is something, somebody that you would like to serve. Oh, that's fantastic. Greg, thank you for joining us today. It's great to have you. Appreciate your insights and perspective. Uh, I want to give a special thanks to Anna, who is our producer behind the scenes. You can't see her here, but she's been helping arrange things and uh, is ha handling the questions and answers. Thank you all for joining us today. We're going to transition over to uh, questions and answers now. Hey, thanks for watching. After the live show, we set aside time for question and answers, and I'd love to have you join us next time. Go to WooCommerce.com forward slash live and sign up. It's free. You'll get notified when we go live and you'll be part of the live audience where you could ask questions and hang out with us after. I look forward to seeing you there.